From the opening credits of I Walk the Line, we are placed into a dreary little backwoods town in Tennessee. It might as well be the graveyard in the beginning of Night of the Living Dead. Everyone in this small town seems dead inside. You can just see it in their faces. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine, I walk the line As Johnny Cash's iconic song of the same name plays, we get the sense that we may have well entered a Lucio Fulci Italian zombie film because the level of decay is tangible. Director John Frankenheimer finished out the 60s with 1969's The Gypsy Moths. The film was met with both critical and audience apathy. Frankenheimer felt the studio sabotaged the film with several phantom family-friendly edits without his consent. John was in a bad mood to say the least. The once celebrated could do no wrong director of the 60s had now hit a slight lull in his career. The theme of the middle-aged man in a dead-end career and marriage looking for a new life was a theme that resonated with Frankenheimer. In both of his films, Seconds, and later on, in 52 Pickup, it becomes the protagonist's main inner conflict. Madison Jones' book, An Exile, had those elements, and John's production company was planning to make this film with another director at the helm. While prepping the film The Horseman, lead actor Omar Sharif had a conflict that would keep him unavailable for about 10 months. John, as a favor to the studio, who was already paying him to wait on Sharif, asked him if he would take over the directing reins on an exile, and wanted Gregory Peck to star. Frankenheimer wanted Gene Hackman, but since he was essentially being double paid, he granted the studio's wishes and went with Peck instead. An exile was eventually retitled to September Country, and then finally, I Walk the Line once Johnny Cash got involved with the soundtrack of the film. The story of I Walk the Line centers on Sheriff Henry Taus, played by Gregory Peck, in what we think will be his usual larger-than-life iconic hero role, but instead, we get a man on the edge of complete decay. You all right? Yes, sir. Get up out of there. Yes, sir. Peck meets Alma, played by a spunky Tuesday Weld, a new-in-town teen whom he pulls over for driving erratically with her younger brother. It is here where the seeds of both characters are planted, as although words are not said about it then, one's can sense both have uses for the other. Maybe you don't know it, but the way I seen it, there was a boy driving this truck. And you're sure not a boy now, are you? <laughs> no, sir. Once Peck returns to his routine life of family and law enforcement, we discover a very lonely man in a very lonely town. A town that has probably destroyed this man's dreams simply because he could never leave it. Get your paperwork done, Henry? Yeah. You can tell the other townspeople are all in the same boat too, but have accepted their fate. Peck's sheriff has not. Peck's partner, played by Charles Durning, isn't quite as beat down by the system yet. In order for him to be the leader of the dead, so to speak, he has to somehow dethrone Peck by ambition, a trait that has long gone dormant in our current sheriff. People here just try to survive, that's all. Some make a little moonshine, don't really harm nobody, just pushing a little extra sometimes so they don't end up with the chins in their hands for the rest of their lives. Alma, on the other hand, sees an opportunity in Peck, and not necessarily a romantic one, but a business one. Alma's family runs a backwoods moonshiner business, and they are about to be exposed by a looming federal agent hot on their heels. And Alma's relationship with Peck automatically creates a chasm between them and the feds. Alma's father essentially acts as a pimp, saying, yeah, take my daughter, it's good for the family business. Sooner or later, he'll know. We'll take our chances. After all, you won't be getting the worst of it, you hear? You keep on getting the best of it. We got arrangements, you hear? This leaves Peck 
forced to conceal her family's business in order to continue his now spicy relationship with her. Make no mistake, this is a dark movie. At first watch, you think maybe this is going to be a more romantic film on the surface between Peck and Weld, but it's not. It's not about romance at all. This is a film about the depths people will go to to get to a perception of a better place in life. And anyone who is in the way will get hurt, or even killed. It's fitting that at the very beginning of the film, we see shots of a dam, alluding to something is about to break. She a pretty girl? If that's all then, well, from time to time, a man your age does seek out a young girl. Sometimes the Reader's Digest tells how... Oh, that ain't it, Ellen Haney. Peck's relationship with his wife, played by Estelle Parsons, is heartbreaking. But not unlike the extremes we saw in seconds only a few years earlier, Frankenheimer puts us in the room with the couple in turmoil. Alvin Sargent's adapted script reassures us that the results are never good, and the scene between the two once Peck decides his new life awaits him is so difficult to watch. You going off with her, ain't you? I don't know. Oh, God, Henry! <laughs> the married couple's relationship in the book is a bit more dramatic with the wife being more of the stereotypical nag. Frankenheimer thought that making her less sympathetic to the audience was a mistake, so Parson's more nuanced performance here leaves our protagonist with even more imprinted guilt to bear. Originally to be photographed by Seconds Director of Photography James Wong Hao, Hao had to bow out after suffering a stroke while scouting locations in the small Tennessee town. He was replaced by David Walsh, and the town's dreary undertones are beautifully captured here. Most of the film is photographed with a gauzy, dreamy feel. The wide cinemascope look here only helps show the vastness of the Tennessee countryside that has entrapped Peck's character in this hellhole of a town. The photography makes Peck feel like a fish in a fishbowl trying to escape to a more desirable location outside. Frankenheimer said assistants made sure that if it was cloudy outside, they shot outside. If it was sunny outside, they went inside and made it look dark inside. They even had everyone wear muted colors, and if any props or signage had any sort of red in them, they would mute them down. All the music in this film is performed by the legendary Johnny Cash. Peck's character doesn't say a whole lot, but he doesn't have to. Cash's lyrics say what Peck is thinking. But flesh and blood needs flesh and blood, and you're the one I need. Flesh and blood needs flesh and blood, and you're the one I need. Songs such as Cause I Love You and Face of Despair, among others, say what we need to know about the sheriff. It's a bold choice that could have easily backfired, but they work here in this environment, and Cash by Osmosis alone knew the lonely feelings of a small Tennessee town. On the side of the law, on the side of the law, who is right, who is wrong, who is for and who's against the law. As with Peck's wife, his new love Alma is played by Weld with a sense of mystery. She never fully commits to Peck, even though he is heavily smitten with her. His desperation hits a boiling point, and his covering up for her takes such a terrible turn that you almost want to just jump in the movie to stop him. His plan to run away with her to California, ditching everything, goes just horribly awry. He's the only one in the movie who can't see what's coming for him. I figured maybe all the sheriffs around here are mysteriously disappearing. Like in those science fiction books, mushrooms killing off all the politicians I read once. <laughs> I was just looking through. Supposedly in the book, his character met with an even more tragic end of suicide but Frankenheimer, ever the proponent of nuance, leaves his character with perhaps an even more terrible fate. He survives. <laughs> 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 
effectively trapping him in the very town he dreamed of getting out of. But like the opening shot of the film, he has now become one of the haunting faces that dawn the opening credits. Instead of driving around free, he has now joined them as part of the scenery. He is now one of the zombies, a man dead on his feet with no future but to wonder what's outside the fishbowl. John Frankenheimer said in Gerald Pratley's book, The Films of Frankenheimer, that, quote, It's a story about a man who realizes that his life has come to an end. For all the wrong reasons, he goes for a young girl and thinks that that will change everything. It's the second theme again. Go off with me. All right, where do you want to go? Anywhere you want. He thinks he can be reborn that he can change his whole life. This is a theme of mine, the fact that your life cannot change. You are what you are, and you have to live with that." End quote. 